continue our discussion on protein ligand interactions. In this specific lecture, we will be looking at experimental methods in protein ligand interactions. In the specific methods that we will be looking at, we will visit spectroscopic methodologies, ITC, that is isothermal titration calorimetry, differential scanning calorimetry, surface plasmon resonance. We have to remember that these are some of the techniques that are used. There are many techniques that are used to determine the protein ligand interactions that we have discussed in the previous lectures. For example, the construction of the binding curve. How do we know whether we have an exothermic or an endothermic reaction? Can we discuss the thermodynamic parameters? How are we supposed to determine the thermodynamic parameters from the data that we have? When we look at macromolecule ligand binding, therefore, we see we have our protein and we have our ligand. Now, based on this, we see that we look at the equilibrium associated with this association. Then we have our new factor, that is the concentration of the protein ligand complex divided by the total amount of protein that we have. And we remember that the total amount of protein has to be either in the free form or in the bound form. From this, we can get the dissociation constant or the association constant, depending upon how we write our equilibrium condition. From the dissociation constant, from the equilibrium constant, we can get the free energy associated with this at the specific temperature of the experiment. So if we look at ligand binding in general, we looked at this diagram initially, where we have our protein, and we are adding a particular ligand to the protein, forming the protein ligand complex. As we add the ligand, we can monitor the titration of the protein with the ligand at a specific wavelength, where we see that we have the peak. Now, at any given wavelength, the total absorbance is the sum of the absorbance contribution from each of the species that we have here. Now, given that we are looking at this particular wavelength, where we have the concentration of the PL increase as the ligand is being added to the solution. So this is the peak where we do not have the ligand, the total protein. And as we go along this curve, we see the amount of ligand added. And from that, we can find out our value of mu and the protein ligand concentration, as well as the free protein that is available to us. Another aspect of determining thermodynamic parameters comes from the Van't Hoff equation. In the Van't Hoff equation, this represents the relation between the change in the equilibrium constant, that is the equilibrium, of a specific chemical reaction and the change in the temperature T. Now, at constant pressure, we have the Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. We know at equilibrium that delta G0 is equal to minus RT ln KQ. K equilibrium and from this we can work it out in a manner that we get this in terms of the enthalpic contributions. Looking at this specific relationship we can rewrite it as this expression where we are looking at the K equilibrium we know how to find the K equilibrium and from this we have to see what information we can plot to get the specific thermodynamic parameters. So we can have the equilibrium constant determined at two different temperatures. And from the slope of the curve, we can determine, or just by plugging in the values of the T2 and the T1, the K equilibrium obtained at these two temperatures, we can get the value of delta H. In addition to this, using this particular equation, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, we get a specific expression in terms of looking at the delta H contribution and the delta S contribution given our K equilibrium. This expression is known as the Van Hoff equation. And it indicates that if we plot, it is of the form of Y is equal to MX plus C. If we plot 
ln k equilibrium versus 1 by t, we can see that the slope is minus delta h 0 by r and the intercept is plus delta s by r. So we can have an exothermic reaction where we will get a delta h value e less than 0. We can have an endothermic reaction where our delta h value will be greater than 0 and we see the slope of the plots in the in each of the cases because in this case we have minus delta h by r is greater than 0 in a positive slope and in the endothermic case we have the minus delta h by 0 less than 0. So this gives us an indication of how we can determine thermodynamic parameters. Let us look at a specific example now where we are looking at the ligand binding to human serum albumin, the abundant protein in our plasma. This is the structure of human serum albumin. If we want to look at a specific ligand binding to HSA, we can opt for this tryptophan residue and see how the fluorescence of the tryptophan residue is affected by the binding of the ligand. In this particular case, we can choose this ligand, epigallocatechin gallate, EGCG, and see what difference in the spectra we observe on binding of EGCG. So this is our structure of EGCG and this is what happens to the fluorescence intensity at this specific wavelength that corresponds to the tryptophan residue and the reduction in the fluorescence intensity at that point of the emission of the tryptophan indicates that this particular ligand is going to the site where the tryptophan is present. Fortunately, HSA has only one tryptophan, so it is an indication that this EGCG that is marked here is going to the site where the tryptophan is present. We will see how we can look at this data or how we can construct such diagrams in the next lecture. So when we look at this ligand binding now to human serum albumin, we can conduct this specific experiment at different temperatures. And from a scatter plot, we can get the value of n, that is the number of the stoichiometry of the equation. And from this information, we can plot a Van der Waals, a Van Hoff plot, where we have the ln k versus the 1 by t. We have a positive slope. So from this, we can get our slope and our intercept, getting our thermodynamic parameters. So this is a way in which we can determine the thermodynamic parameters for ligands binding to proteins. In this case, we looked at a specific fluorescent spectroscopic technique. If our protein ligand is such that there is a change in the UV spectra, we can also monitor that. Our idea is to monitor the reduction in protein concentration, the increase in protein ligand concentration, to monitor the effect of the K equilibrium that is observed. Another technique that is used is fluorescence polarization. In this case, we have, as we looked at these fluorescence-based techniques, where you're using them for investigating the intermolecular interactions, including anisotropy, correlation spectroscopy, time-resolved fluorescence, as well as fluorescence polarization. In this case, this, has, this specific method has the capacity to measure the kinetics and the thermodynamics of protein ligand binding. So the principle of fluorescence polarization derives from the fact that at the initial polarized fluorescence emission becomes unpolarized over time and this would happen when the ligand is in the unbound state. As such, it can be utilized for competition binding analysis in which the ligand molecules are bound and then they can be used for competing ligands to measure the affinity for both labeled and unlabeled ligands also. So let us see how this works. So if we have a polarized excitation and we have a ligand molecule that has this tag along with it, because it is small, in size, there is rapid rotation of the small molecule fluorophore resulting in a low signal. However, if this were attached to the protein 
because of the larger molecule, the macromolecule that is this fluorophore is now attached to, the motion of the molecule is slowed down. The rapid rotation is no longer possible, giving us a high FP signal, which can be monitored. The advantages of this technique makes use of a single fluorescent label, but it also could be proportional to the binding and is not a direct measure. And there could be absorptive interference or inner filter effects possible. And the binding to the protein may also be affected by the fluorescence label. Another method that is commonly used to determine the thermodynamics of the binding reaction measures the heat evolved or absorbed during the binding reaction. This is the isothermal titration calorimetry where we look at the specific expressions that we know for delta G0 minus RT ln K equilibrium and minus delta G0, delta H0 minus T delta S. Now, when we, we know how we can monitor the K equilibrium, given that we know a methodology to determine the free protein and the bound protein. From that, we can get a scatter plot from the scatter plot, plot, we can get the stoichiometry. We can also get the dissociation constant, which is what we are interested in in a protein ligand binding experiment. In this particular diagram, we see that there is a reference cell and there is a sample cell. And this is the syringe that is used for sample injection. The sample cell contains the macromolecule in the buffer solution and the ligand is present in the syringe. So this is where we have the ligand and in the sample cell here we have our protein of interest or the macromolecule of interest. This ligand is then injected into the macromolecule, in this case the protein, by contro computer controlled injections. There is in here a small paddle shaped tip of the needle that ensures rapid mixing of the components as these micro injections are made. Following the micro injections, these coin shaped cells that are in the adiabatic chamber are kept at the same temperature and the delta T is very small between these two. And the temperature measured here is extremely precise. We have to be careful because the sample can get heated fast and cooling is slow. So the sample should be colder than the experimental temperature when the loading is done. So given our experiment, we have our protein in this cell here our reference cell here and the ligand being injected into the protein of interest. During the injections, there is the occurrence of a reaction, an interaction that results in either the evolution of heat or the absorption of heat. What is going to happen in that case is there is going to be a temperature difference between the reference cell and the sample cell. How is this treated? So when this injection is made, heat will be either generated or absorbed by the interaction, giving us either an exothermic or an endothermic reaction. The heat input in the sample cell is adjusted to keep the delta T constant. And what we observe is we, in the exothermic reaction, we see negative peaks because less heat is needed when the reaction proceeds. Conversely, when we look at an endothermic reaction, this will result in a positive peak because more heat will be needed when the reaction proceeds. This heat port is then integrated over time until it reaches the baseline. So the heat generated or absorbed after each injection is a function of the ligand concentration in that injection and the total amount of the ligand added till that point. So when we have the first injection, we have 
heat variations, heat changes comes back to the baseline leading to the next injection and so on and so forth. So depending upon the injections and depending upon it coming back to the baseline every time before the next injection occurs, we have to monitor the data. So the ITC measurements have this as the raw data and this corresponds to the concentration of the molecule in the cell, the number of binding sites present on the protein, the binding constant and the enthalpy of the reaction. The observed heat change per injection given by dq by dlt is fitted now into a theoretical binding curve from which we can get the stoichiometry, we can get the enthalpy, and we can get the affinity. This is useful for determining the thermodynamic parameters of the particular protein ligand interaction. So how do we get the thermodynamic parameters? This is a typical binding curve, which gives you the kilocal per mole of injection of the injectant and the molar ratio that is observed. Following this, this binding curve, as we recognize, resembles the traditional binding curves that we have seen. From this, we can get the KD value, the dissociation constant. We can get the delta H value, the delta G value, and the delta S value following the thermodynamic experiment from an ITC instrument, the isothermal titration calorimetry. The temperature dependence of enthalpy, entropy, and the Gibbs free energy of a binding of IPM to this particular dehydrogenase is now shown here. So we have a, pro, a ligand that is 3 isopropyl malate and the protein 3 isopropyl malate dehydrogenase. This is the typical curve that we get from the change and from the temperature changes associated with this and this gives us an idea of the typical values. In a differential scanning calorimetry method, this is also a commonly used method for studying thermal stability and phase transition of proteins as well as other biomacromolecules. In this case, the thermogram, as it is called, helps us measure very high binding constants and in addition, it can also measure weak binding constants. It is also possible to measure the stoichiometry of the complex at excess ligand concentrations and also account for simultaneous binding to several centers that could also have centers with low affinity. So there could be sites that have low affinity for the ligand that also can be monitored through DS. In this case also, we are looking at heat capacity changes of a heated sample, and this is widely used in the protein denaturation. In this case, what happens? There is a shift of the denaturation peak to higher temperatures in the presence of a ligand, and this indicates that there is ligand binding. So if we have, this is a structure of human serum albumin. If we have a drug with a particular dissociation attached to this, we have a typical increased drug concentration occurring here that gives us a variation in the heat capacity of our sample. And from that, we can determine the specific values. So we are looking at the study of the binding of albumin with this particular ligand. Another technique that is commonly used nowadays is surface plasmon resonance. In surface plasmon resonance spectroscopy, it is a rapidly developing technique. It is used for the study of ligand binding interactions with proteins, which is the subject of our study. This is an optical based method and it measures the change in the refractive index near a sensor surface. It is capable of measuring real time quantification of protein ligand binding kinetics and affinities. So it has the advantage of giving us a time component in the understanding of the protein ligand interactions. So what we have here, this allows a real-time label-free detection of biomolecular interaction. 
what happens in this case? This occurs when we have the polarized light that strikes an electrically conducting surface at an interface between the two medium. So, when we have the SPR occurring, when the light strikes the media, this is what is happening. We have our receptors that are attached to the gold film that is on the glass slide, a glass surface of a glass slide. As our ligand or our analyte is flowed over the surface, there is an interaction between the receptor on the surface and the analyte that is flowed on the surface if there happens to be an interaction. In that case, this generates an electron charge density waves that are called plasmons that reduce the intensity of the reflected light at a specific angle that is the resonance angle. So here we see the specific angle here that is our resonance angle. This, so this is our light source and if there is any change in the mass if this ligand is bound to the receptor, then this can be detected. This has been developed and performed predominantly using this technology, BFO technology. So let us see how it works. The target molecules, the proteins, are immobilized on the surface that we see here, that is the gold film on the glass slide. The sample with potential ligand is ejected over the surface where we have the flow of the analyte. If there is an interaction, the angle of minimum intensity reflected light is detected. This gives a change as the molecule binds and dissociates and the interaction profile is recorded in real time in what is called a sensor gram. So we see an association followed by a dissociation depending upon how strong the affinity of the ligand is for the receptor molecule. This is a typical sensor gram, which is a plot of the response against time, showing the progression of the interaction. So we are looking initially at the baseline that is corresponds to the running buffer. So the bars below the curve here, this is a schematic of a sensor gram. The bars below the curve here indicate the solutions that pass over the sensor surface. So initially we have a baseline because this is just the running buffer. As we have the sample injected, there is association that is given by this sensor. Then there is dissociation followed by regeneration and then goes back to the baseline where a further injection can be done or further flow of the analyte can be done. Now, when we look at the sensorgram data from an interaction, this provides data on binding, answers the question, does the interacting partner bind to the target molecule? It tells us about the specificity. To what extent does the interacting partner cross-react with the other molecules? It tells us about the concentration, how much of a given molecule is present and active. And most importantly, it tells us also about the kinetics of the particular reaction going on. What are the rates of association and dissociation that can be measured from the specific sensor gram and how strong is the binding, whether we have a low affinity binding or a high affinity binding from the specific data. So when we look at the shape of the sensor gram, this actually gives us information about the interaction. So we are looking at the resonance signal. We are looking at the binding of the target molecule. In this case, we have the association followed by the dissociation. If there is no binding to the target molecule, there is no change of the resonance signal with time as would be expected. If we now look at a rapid association or a slow association and dissociation, 
A rapid association would mean a very fast binding. Similarly, a fast dissociation. However, when we have a slow association, we see this indicative of a slow association and this indicative of a slow dissociation, meaning that we would have the affinity less in a case where there is slow association because we would expect for a rapid association a sudden binding and a sudden increase in the resonance signal. So this is indicative of a strong interaction and this is, is resonance signal being lower is indicative of a weak reaction. So we see that the shape of the sensorgram gives us information about the interaction, about the affinity, about the association and dissociation characteristics. Additionally, it can also give us information about multiple binding where we could have these changes in response and we could have multiple binding associated with different kinds of response in the sensorgram. So what we have looked at in the previous lecture is the determination of association and dissociation constants from a knowledge of our protein concentration, our ligand concentration, and how they interact to give us our protein ligand complex in an equilibrium situation. We understood how we can plot the scattered plots that give us an indication about the stoichiometry, give us an indication about the variations in our reaction or our interactions in this case. So we look at an association constant in the typical law of mass action where we are looking at an equilibrium situation in the thermodynamics of the specific interaction. The Ka value we know is now the inverse of our KD value. We looked at specific spectroscopic methods, particularly fluorescence and fluorescence depolarization to see how the interaction of the ligand with the protein can change the characteristic spectrum of the protein. To have a knowledge, get a knowledge of the protein ligand concentration or the depletion of the protein concentration. Other interactions that give us thermodynamic characteristics of our specific interaction between the protein and the ligand are given by isothermal titration calorimetry, differential scanning calorimetry. And in surface plasmon resonance, we can follow the kinetics of the association and the dissociation and we can measure the binding, the specificity of binding, the ligand affinity, and we can follow this association with time. These are the references that have been followed. Thank you.